Well, it's really uh, a pleasure for me to be uh, invited and be able to speak uh, in front of you today about some of the work we've been doing over the last five years, uh, in particular with relation to barcoding and uh, reduction of errors and improvements in efficiencies in the anatomic pathology laboratory. Um, we always start with the disclosures. Um, the software that we've developed, uh, we've been fortunate to be able to license commercially uh, through the University of Washington, both to um, uh, end users and also by way of a uh, of company that uh, remarkets to uh, end user pathology labs. There are other barcoding solutions that are out there uh, commercially available. And I don't have any relationships except that I was uh, invited to speak at a, um, uh, give a talk similar to this one at an event um, uh, put on by Thermo Fisher a couple of weeks ago. Um, I will show a couple of screenshots from our laboratory information system, PowerPath, but PowerPath is uh, completely separate and I don't want anybody to be confused that the two are related. So in many um, medical centers and many departments around the country, anatomic pathology and laboratory medicine are part of the same uh, department. In this institution, uh, decisions were made years ago that separated the two and that laboratory medicine tends to analyze specimens that are uh, liquid, uh, whereas anatomic pathology gets uh, solid specimens, uh, basically tissue that surgeons remove from the operating room and sends them down to us for analysis. And the general workflow is that the surgeon removes a specimen from the patient. Uh, the uh, big specimen is sliced into smaller pieces, and then even smaller pieces of tissue are removed from it uh, and put into these white cassettes uh, filled with paraffin to make tissue blocks. And from these tissue blocks, uh, slides are ultimately made, uh, looked at under the microscope, um, and interpreted by the pathologist, and finally a report is written. And all along the way, uh, there are issues with keeping track of, of the specimens and all the derivative materials from them. So that um, you know, it's, you know, when we have about 200 specimens a day come through the pathology lab here at UWMC, it is a real problem keeping track of all the different blocks and slides that, uh, that come from it. And one has to uh, label things. And um, through uh, up to about 2004, a lot of the labeling was done manually in that uh, the specimens were in these large containers and people wrote things on the outside of the containers manually with different numbers. Uh, blocks were made, they were printed offline and sort of grouped together with the specimens on the counter. And then when microscopic slides were made, the histotex would hand write a label on the slides and, uh, and try to keep track of everything that way. Well, there are two fundamental problems with that. One is all the hand labeling is tedious, time consuming, doesn't work very well. And the other is that it's error prone, that people make errors, people who have bad handwriting uh, may uh, make their numbers perfectly according to them, but another person walks up and can't read them. So those are both huge problems. And they result in uh, labeling errors. Now, we looked at um, the magnitude of the uh, labeling errors or the specimen identification errors that we were having in the pathology department, and we keep ongoing quality assurance records where we you know, are supposed to write down every time there's a problem and how it was reconciled. And we went back to those records and for a whole year said, gee, it's not too bad of a problem. We had about 100 blocks last year that were mislabeled, and we all started to feel good. And then we started to talk to the people in the lab and say, gee, you're doing a good job, only 100, you know, that's only a couple of months and you're finding them all. And then people started looking at us kind of funny and not really wanting to admit it. And in actuality, uh, there was a real reporting problem. And the true number of blocks that were mislabeled initially before they were caught was closer to 1,000 a year. Um, similarly, slides, if you look in the records, there were only about 1,600 or 16, excuse me, that were uh, incorrectly labeled in a year. But uh, the actual number is higher than that for a variety of reasons. This is really an unacceptable problem in the pathology department because every time something is mislabeled, a patient is at risk for getting um, uh, mistreated because of uh, those identification errors. The two imperatives we operate under in academic uh, uh, anatomic pathology uh, these days are to improve quality uh, and some of that is by way of uh, uh, correct diagnoses, but uh, quality in the sense that we're using it in this talk is patient safety, and that means uh, labeling errors. 
and also were under uh, uh, pressure to improve the efficiency in the pathology laboratories so that uh, for a given uh, number of employees, we can do even more work than before. And often quality and efficiency are like two sides of a teeter-totter. If you have a process and you want to make it more efficient, you remove some steps, but at the cost of increased numbers of errors. On the other hand, if you want to make a process very reliable, you put in more and more quality assurance steps, but that drives down the efficiency of the process. The, the real secret is to try to get quality and efficiency aligned in some way so that you can improve both and that everybody benefits. So how in the world uh, can you apply barcoding or what does barcoding have to do with quality and efficiency? If you look at data entry uh, sort of numbers and these uh, slides, the next couple of slides I believe come from Mike Astian, uh, a human being doing data entry will make an error about once every 300 keystrokes or so. That's just the way we are. That's, that's for good people. Some of them, like me, uh, make a few more errors than that. Um, if you have information that's encoded in, say, a data matrix barcode like this and scan it, the error rate is orders of magnitude lower than that, maybe 1 in 10 million to 1 in 600 million. Uh, so you have the dramatic opportunities for increasing accuracy for data entry. If you look at labeling um, processes, a single human being labeling something, again, will make errors on the order of about 1% of the time. If you want to make an end-to-end -end process that involves human beings more accurate, you can have error-checking people downstream from the first pe person uh, to, uh, to catch any errors and fix them. And if you do that, you can get an error rate down on the order of one in a thousand. But that's about the best that you can do if you have a process that depends on people. If you, and that's about where uh, we are with uh, specimen identification in the uh, anatomic pathology lab. At least that's where we were a couple years ago. If you want to go to more accurate processes, you have to use some sort of automation. You have to use some sort of uh, advanced design. But the paradox is that if you take any process and you add technology to it, the whole process gets less efficient. Okay, that was hard for me to accept at first, but the real secret to this, to understanding this, is knowing that if you're going to apply technology, you have to change the process in such a way that you can take advantage of the technology. And that's really where the win potentially is with relationship to barcoding. So what is barcoding? The way I think about barcoding it really um, has three levels of functionality. Uh, the first is labeling, and labeling is simple. That means you put barcodes on things. Um, it's easy to do. It doesn't require a whole lot. Uh, most things that you label with barcodes, uh, you can do it fairly inexpensively. Sometimes uh, for uh, equipment like uh, cassettes, uh, you require special uh, equipment that costs a little bit more. But generally, it's pretty simple and, and doesn't get you a whole lot. Tracking is sort of the next is the next level of functionality, and with this you can get location updates for items. So if you scan a barcode, you can have the computer record when and where that uh, barcode was scanned, um, and it's really good for things like inventory control. Um, but fundamentally, tracking, if that's all you're doing, is another extra step. You have the same process in place, but you're asking somebody to scan a barcode along the way. Um, it needs specialized software, costs a little bit more, but again, it's mostly an extra work process. It's like an extra quality assurance step. What you really would like to do is to be able to move into the driving range of functionality with barcoding. And this is where you use the barcodes to expedite the workflow. That is, you have the software react to a scan so that it then does work that a human being used to do and does it more accurately. This is what you call disruptive technology in that the old workflows don't work anymore because you're using the computer to take advantage of things to actually drive the functionality. Um, it requires interoperability with the laboratory inter information system and the solutions like this tend to be on the expensive side because there's a lot of work that's involved in working with users to try to come up with optimal ways of configuring the software to do these. Why would you want to barcode? Well, some of these things we've talked about already. Certainly, error reduction and improvements in patient safety are um, uh, definite goals. 
uh, reducing medical legal liability, the consequences of making a mistake with, uh, with uh, labeling items. And uh, in anatomic pathology, we have a custodial responsibility to keep track of blocks and slides and specimens. And all of those are easier if you can have barcodes uh, that manage uh, the locations of items. But there are also efficiency reasons. If you're using the driving level of functionality for barcoding, you can make your workflow process a lot um, more efficient. You can do your job faster. And you get indirect benefits because people don't have to waste time running around correcting errors that somebody else made. Beginning in 2004, we began uh, writing our own software because there was nothing available uh, commercially that would allow us to do uh, barcoding in anatomic pathology, uh, even at the most primitive level of doing labeling of items. It's sort of ironic that we've been able to go to the uh, grocery store for 30 years and buy anything off the shelf that has a barcode on it, but uh, until about 2005, there were no barcodes in the anatomic pathology laboratory. Um, in 2005, we delivered software um, that uh, allows us to track slides, uh, location updates as they move, as the slides move around the department. Um, we were really trying to attack the lost slide problem. It turns out we were spending at least a half FTE, uh, one person half time doing nothing but running around trying to find slides that were lost. Um, conference preparation was horrible because you had to pull all these microscopic slides together and nobody knew where the slides were. Uh, the next year we put uh, labels on specimens and then um, uh, late last year we began putting barcodes on blocks and slides and using those barcodes with some really uh, good software to drive the workflow and improve the quality processes and efficiency processes. And those are the things that I'd like to uh, show you today. In all these things, one of the primary goals is to eliminate all manual labeling of everything. So things get barcoded, and then barcodes beget barcodes, and no human being ever gets to do anything other than press a button that says, make me a new item of some sort. And um, the workflow is facilitated, and we try to make information available to all the users with a just-in-time display uh, functionality. We started off um, with some general design principles for the software we were going to build. And one of these was that we were never going to ask a user to scan a barcode unless it was to that user's immediate and direct benefit to scan the barcode. And that's tremendously useful because it really um, enhances user acceptance and minimizes the amount of training that you have to do. Uh, people want to use the system if, if it's doing work for them. Um, again, we wanted to eliminate manual data entry. We wanted to drive the workflow. We wanted to do just-in-time material creation. If you pre-label something and then don't use it until 10 or 20 minutes later or an hour later, you have to manage that item and keep track of it and make sure it doesn't get mixed up with something else. We didn't want to make things in advance. We wanted to make them just at the time that they were, they were needed. And of course, no assumptions. You know, you never allow a user to say they did something. The only thing we'll trust is a barcode scan event. And in all these things, we wanted to leverage the capabilities of the laboratory information system, which in our case is PowerPath. So starting in the gross room, our uh, development target was, uh, again, foolproof labeling. We wanted to uh, reduce the dependence on support staff, uh, reduce the waste of cassettes, because we were making more cassettes than we needed, just in anticipation of use and then ending up throwing them away. And we wanted to make the, the so-called grossing step, where the large specimens are cut into smaller pieces and put into cassettes, go at least as fast as before, because that's the rate-limiting bottleneck. Uh, another way of looking at our design target is to say, I want to build a system that's so bulletproof that a resident, and I'm picking on residents because they tend to be the least trained people in the uh, gross room, that a resident can come in late at night when nobody else is around, and they can make their own cassettes and make their own specimen labels without ever making a mistake. Um, so when specimens first come into the laboratory, they're accessioned into the laboratory information system and uh, an accession number is assigned. Uh, in this case, it's number 15. Um, and then we generate a barcode that goes, um, a barcoded label that goes on the paperwork and another barcode that goes on the specimen container itself. 
And I'm going to show you in the next few minutes a couple of really bad movies. And uh, uh, I can say that they're bad because I took them and I know they're really bad. But they illustrate uh, what we do here. And they all look like they're sort of simple movies because um, they get the computer to do a lot of the work for them. So at this first step, it's just how do you print specimen labels? Um, now, PowerPath, um, when you accession a specimen, you have to hit the F10 key in order to save uh, the, uh, the, the specimen in the database. And so we have uh, some cute software that just sits on the computer and listens for that F10 keystroke. Right there is the keystroke. Our application pops up. She hit the F10 keystroke a second time, and all the labels popped out over there. So what's the incremental amount of work that she had to do to print all of her specimen labels and, and uh, paperwork labels for the case? It was a single press of one F10 uh, keystroke. So that's, that's a win for her because it saved her several minutes of writing on cassettes or writing on specimen bottles and writing uh, numbers on paperwork, and it's a far more accurate process also. Now, if you look downstream at the next step at the grossing station, this is the step where uh, uh, a highly trained uh, pathologist assistant or pathologist or resident stands at the grossing station and um, uh, inspects the large specimens and takes smaller pieces. And one way to look at the workflow in the grossing step is to say that all kinds of specimens come in, they accumulate on the counter, they wait, and all of it funnels through the bottleneck, which is that person examining one specimen at a time and taking pieces of tissue, and once they've done it, then those pieces of tissue and their cassettes go downstream and the pressure is off. So there's really a tight bottleneck here. And the traditional processes are all optimized, or all constructed, rather, with the notion of trying to make the throughput at that bottleneck step as fast as possible. So in the classic um, process, Specimens come in, they get labeled. The cassettes get labeled ahead of time because we want the, that pathologist or resident to have the cassettes right handy, ready to go as the instant they need them. But those specimens have to, or those cassettes have to be managed. They have to be grouped together with the specimens. They have to be moved to a staging area. They get moved onto the gross bench. Um, they, once you uh, get a specimen out, you have to lay them out and take the lids off. Uh, you put pieces of tissue in them to fill them, and then you close the lids. Maybe you need more cassettes. You have to request more. Somebody has to print them and bring them over to you. Uh, after you're done, you rack the cassettes up. And then our process in 2004 and 2005 was that you had to then go back to the computer, the laboratory information system, and enter each and every cassette into the laboratory information system. You had to tell it uh, how many cassettes that you just made. Uh, that's the reconciliation process, and then things get uh, taken off for processing. Now, if you, do the, if you look at this process using a lean workflow analysis, instead of looking at a human being doing things, you take the position of being a physical item, in this case, a cassette. And you say, if I'm a cassette, how many times did I get handled in this whole process? And shown with bold underline are all the active verbs, which are the handling steps. And there are about 11 different steps through this whole process where cassettes get handled. Um, there are about nine of these steps that have error opportunities. Either the initial labeling could be wrong or the stack of cassettes that was grouped together with a specimen falls on the floor and people pick them up and group them together wrong. They get mixed up in some way. Um, uh, more cassettes are needed and they're, they're labeled wrong. Something can go wrong with all of these different steps. And everybody knows this is an imperfect process. So people put quality assurance steps in place. And there are, uh, looks like about seven different quality assurance steps that we do. A lot of them are visual indicators. The very first thing we train residents to do when they're first learning how to do pathology is you always check the paperwork against the label on the specimen. You check the specimen label against the block label. You check, check, check all the time just to make sure that there isn't an error of some sort in the labeling and that you're working with the right materials. Well, this is uh, both error prone and inefficient. Let's do a thought experiment. What if we were going to do a just-in-time slide or cassette creation process such that instead of pre-labeling all these cassettes and making them ahead of time, that we have barcodes on the specimen 
And right before the cassettes are filled, we're going to scan a barcode on the specimen and make newly labeled cassettes. What does our workflow look like at that point? And you can see that we, we, our specimen label process is the same, but now there are many fewer handling steps for the cassettes. The cassettes don't even exist until right when you need them. Only one of these steps has an error opportunity to it, and that's within one specimen you might lay out the empty cassettes in the wrong order. Uh, and that's not nearly the same hazard that some of the other errors are. And there are fewer possibilities where you might need quality assurance steps. So I'm going to show you uh, the screenshots from the software that we uh, wrote that runs at the uh, growth station that does this. So the, the context here is a large specimen is, is on the grossing bench. And uh, the uh, pathologist assistant or the resident has scanned the barcode on the specimen and brought this up. And he's now ready to make cassettes and go on with his work. And so at this point, all he does is on the touchscreen monitor, he said, I want one more cassette, and I want it printed. And in the background, there's this nice uh, uh, single hopper cassette printer that's made by General Data that printed that cassette. Here he decided he needed one more cassette on that case, and just is two touches on the screen, and the cassette pops out. The computer already knew which specimen he was dealing with. The computer already knew what the last block was, or the last cassette that he printed before this, and he didn't have to uh, specify um, uh, anything other than touch the, the uh, button on the screen. And everything um, was handled by the computer then. So, whoops. Uh, so what did he do? Again, he scanned the specimen barcode before the movie started. He printed one cassette, uh, printed another cassette. After he was filling them, you probably saw the two little windows that popped up on the screen that had some colored buttons on them. Uh, those little windows were where he could enter, if he wanted to, the number of pieces of tissue that were uh, in each cassette, and that's critical information uh, for small biopsies. Uh, and he can also add any special embedding instructions, if any were needed. And then at the same time, the computer took care of ordering all those blocks in PowerPath so that the reconciliation process with the lab information system was taken care of automatically. The benefits from this are with both quality and efficiency. So the efficiency part of it, by not pre-printing and sorting cassettes, we, we no longer do a whole class of work that we used to do. The just-in-time cassette printing is very quick. Um, we do things uh, to exploit the, um, uh, the specimen panels in the LIS so that if there is a specimen panel that says we always do three cassettes on this specimen, uh, the, uh, the software knows about those, that standing order for three cassettes, and then it only takes a single touchscreen touch to print all three of those. And again, everything's ordered automatically. From the quality standpoint, there's no manual labeling there of any of those cassettes. Everything is done with high legibility, bar, um, human readable labels and barcoded uh, labels so that we can take advantage of those barcodes as we go downstream. And importantly, for quality assurance purposes, as soon as that cassette is uh, scanned, the computer knows about it so that one can run difference reports with downstream processes and say, how many cassettes left the gross bench but did not show up at a downstream process? So if anything goes missing along the way for some reason, we can know about it right away, find it, um, and reconcile the problems. So this is a summary of the sort of benefits that we got. Reduced uh, handling steps, reduced error opportunities, comparing the classic process with the just-in-time process. Um, our cassette wastage went from about 7% of all the cassettes we printed down to zero, uh, or near zero. The thing that I'm most proud of is the primary cassette labeling errors. Remember that for a year, we were getting almost 1,000 mislabeled cassettes under the old process. Uh, when we put the new process in place, in the first three months, we had a total of two uh, cassettes that uh, were labeled wrong. And that's because somebody who is very creative found a way around the software. Um, we uh, then plugged that software hole. And in the last seven months, we haven't had a single mislabeled cassette uh, in the gross room. That's a huge win because it um, uh, we get uh, support staff um, benefits, both because we're not doing that upfront uh, labeling work, but also nobody has to run around and deal with the incorrectly labeled cassettes. 
and clean up errors. And the critical bottleneck step where the resident or PA or pathologist stands is even faster than it was before. So that's a win all the way around. If you move downstream into the histology lab, so what happens with the cassettes after they leave the gross bench? They go on a tissue processor, which is usually an overnight run. And very early the next morning, the histotechs come in and they get the, um, the cassettes out of the tissue processor and they have to do this step called embedding where they put the tissue in a mold, fill the mold with paraffin wax and put the uh, uh, cassette on top of it and make what we call a block. And there's certain information that they need to know um, in order to do their job right. They have to know which cassettes have to be handled first because if two or three hundred come off the processor at the same time, if there's a, uh, a small number of high priority cassettes in there, they better do those first and, uh, so that those um, can get, uh, the slides can get made and diagnoses uh, taken care of quickly. Um, sometimes there are special uh, cutting instructions or embedding instructions. Sometimes they need to know um, how many pieces of tissue are in a block and whether or not the block got decalcified. Now, before um, the barcoding was around, um, uh, the laboratory information system sometimes is able to do these things, but often the workflow with the LISs is really not set up so that it's easy for uh, people in the lab to use them. Um, and so uh, people would use different colored cassettes to indicate the sorts of downstream uh, bits of information that somebody had to do, like yellow cassettes were high priority cassettes. Brown cassettes meant it was a lymph node that needed to be cut on a lymph node protocol with a certain number of uh, slides. Um, uh, I think green cassettes were used for skin biopsies because they have to be handled a little bit differently. So all that sort of um, ad hoc offline uh, information was passed along, but they're at the cost of a lot of upfront complexity because you had to have large numbers of different colored cassettes around and you had to train people to know which colored cassette to use for, uh, for each different type of specimen. And you could actually make errors getting things in the wrong colored cassettes, and then the wrong thing got done to specimens. So there are other ways of doing this. Uh, there is a legitimate use for color, I think, in terms of indicating priority, although there are things that we can do with the, with the label on those uh, general data generated cassettes that can take that place. But all of these other things can be taken care of with properly designed software that uses barcoding technology. The, uh, at the embedding step, the development target is to make sure that the embedders have the critical information that they need at the time they do the embedding. And so this is uh, information about number of pieces of tissue and any special embedding instructions. And the workflow has to be really efficient. So the, the software application here is very simple. You have the, the cassette that has a block on it. You scan the barcode on it. The computer then displays on screen all the information that the person needs. And I won't show you that because it's just really simple, but the computer also does some things in the background. You remember, every time somebody scans something, the computer does a timestamp. It knows who, re who scanned it and when it was scanned, and that also allows us to, in the background, do quality assurance and quality improvement uh, reports. As you go down to the next step, which is the histotechnologist uh, is cutting slides, there's really quite complex workflow here. This is actually the most complex development environment I've ever worked in, just because there are so many different variations in the workflow. Uh, you have issues like whether you print slide labels in advance or use direct printing on the slide uh, technology. Do you pre-print all the labels in a big batch or do you print them one at a time right at the uh, workstation. Um, other things like if somebody is cutting multiple slides off of one block, they have to put the block on ice in between each different level so that the paraffin hardens and so that uh, the block gets hydrated so the tissue can be cut well. None of those things are things that software engineers know about until they actually go into the laboratory and start talking to people and maybe deliver an application or two and then go in and say, well, how do you think of my great uh, software application makes your life a whole lot better, right? And they get sadly informed that, well, maybe it doesn't do quite as well for them as, uh, as they thought it was going to be. 
Plus, in the histology lab, there are uh, real constraints with uh, power and space. Nobody ever thought of building a histology lab with computer networking in it before. Um, money is an issue. Some of the most interesting people in the whole pathology department work in the histology laboratories. It's, it's really a great environment uh, to work with. And you have all these legacy processes that involve color that you have to wean people away from in order to transition over to barcoding technology. So it, it's really quite a complex job to, to develop software that works well in this environment. Uh, the development target here is again to present the same sort of critical information that the embedders needed and to make sure that the block, uh, the cassette, and the slide, uh, you remember from a cassette, people cut uh, the tissue off of to put on a slide to make a microscopic slide. You have to make sure that the labeling on those two is exactly the same so that there's no possibility of mixing up uh, slides so that you get slides from one block that got mislabeled with slides from another block. So um, the, the way the workflow is is that after the user scans the block, they get information displayed on the computer. They then put the block in the microtome, cut sections, those, that ribbon of sections gets floated on a water bath, and then um, at some point slides are uh, uh, generated and labeled, and uh, those slides have to, and they then insert the slides underneath the uh, six tissue sections on the water bath and pick them up. Uh, and at that point, right before they pick up the sections off the water bath is where we do the uh, verification. So I'll show you uh, a couple short little movies here. Uh, this is what it's like to do just-in-time uh, slide printing. There she scanned the block. That window uh, that popped up there was synchronizing with the database to make sure the number of orders uh, that the computer knows about are here. She um, moused around, hit the print button, and this um, uh, slide made printer thinks for a moment or two, and then drops out a, a beautifully labeled barcoded slide uh, in the tray right below. Now you can see that particular process was a little bit slow. There was waiting. And that particular workflow is not going to make it for production work. And so we actually modified that uh, so that the histotechs use the system in a different way, that they can actually start pre-printing a number of slides at one time while they're doing something else. Um, after the um, uh, block is scanned, it's put in the microtome, and a ribbon of sections is put in the water bath, which you can barely see here. Here she's got one of those barcoded slides in her hand, and uh, just before she picks up the section off the water bath, she scans the barcode on the slide, the computer checks, there are no error messages, and then she goes ahead and picks up that slide, picks up the section, um, and she's ready to send it off to the stainer and ultimately on to the pathologist and residents. On the other hand, if she made a mistake of some sort uh, and she scans a slide that's not from the block that was last scanned, uh, you can have the computer throw an error message that's as complicated as you want, uh, and that said it, you know, it didn't match that particular block. And so you can immediately catch the errors even before she picked up the section off the water bath and prevent those errors from happening. So the benefits in the histology here are, again, complete elimination of manual labeling. There's no manual labeling of, of any slide. It's barcodes beget barcodes. It's faster to generate the labels that way than it is to, to label slides by hand, particularly if you have to make many slides from the same block. And there are fewer uh, block slide mismatches. And here's an example of uh, the barcoded slides, either using a label format or direct printing on the slides. From the, um, uh, once the, the slides are cut, they're stained, and then um, there's this process where they need to be grouped together. All the slides on the case have to be grouped together, put in folders, and then sent off to the pathologist and resident uh, downstream. And we have a barcoding event, uh, scanning event, where uh, materials get scanned. They get delivered then, and there's a scanning event at delivery where they're dropped off with uh, faculty and residents. Um, when the slides are, are circulate back to the file room after the diagnosis is made and the, and the report is signed, uh, we scan them again. Often slides get pulled for other purposes. Sometimes they get sent out and again we scan them so we have positive confirmation that slides were sent out. Other times they get pulled for clinical correlation conferences and sent around again 
And again, we have scanning events. So at all these different steps, we know where the slides are. I'm going to illustrate a couple of them here. This is one in the histology lab. After the slides are stained, they're put in these folders or pallets, and the folders have barcodes on them. The only restriction on this is all of the slides in a given folder are supposed to go to the same person. You can put slides from as many cases as you want. They're all individually identified in there. And all the uh, histotech has to do is scan the folder, scan the slides. Uh, as she scans them, the, uh, the listed slides appear on the left side of the screen. She chooses who the recipient is there, hits the complete and chip button, and she's done. Looks pretty simple, right? But all kinds of stuff help, happened in the background that is really beneficial to that user. So in PowerPath, there are orders to create things. Like you have to create a specimen, you have to create a block, you have to create a slide. All those orders have to be managed in some way. They're electronic work lists. And it used to be that a user had to go in and check off things on that electronic work list. Well, why would you want to do that? You have the slide with a barcode right in front of you. Implicitly, you know those things were made. You know that slide was made. You know the parent block was made. You know the parent specimen was made. Let's just have the computer close out all those creation orders. Uh, the scan event gets recorded. We make a note in PowerPath as well as in Omnitrax as to um, where the location is for those slides. We initiate a FedEx style shipment because we know which slides we're in which container, that barcoded folder, and we're going to ship that whole container off to the uh, pathologist and resident. We use a mailbox system for uh, deliveries. And uh, at the mailbox, uh, the workflow is very simple. The, use, the person doing the delivery scans the folder, scans the mailbox, hits the enter key on the computer. That's all they have to do. But again, the computer does all kinds of stuff in the background here. Um, let's see, and there she's done with delivering all three of those to the same user. So the computer, uh, just in response to those scan barcode scans and the enter key, uh, completes the shipment. So we have the, the tracking stuff done. And the location of each and every slide that was in that folder is immediately updated. And that information is instantly written uh, to a place where it's visible in PowerPath as well as in Omnitrax, and every PowerPath user can go to that note in PowerPath. They're one click away, and they can tell what the last scan location of every slide was. This is an example of what it looks like. Uh, you know, there, there is a slide location note. There is a different row for each slide, the identification of what that slide is. You can see it was delivered at a particular time to a particular person by a particular person. Um, and every user in the LIS has access to that. Uh, at the slide room, all the slides are scanned when they come in the door and the notes are updated. When slides are checked out internally, like for conference purposes, the workflow is very similar to the histology laboratory and uh, the location events are um, updated. Um, overall, just looking at the slide tracking part of things, we have much less staff time looking for slides. It's uh, faster for people like pathologists to locate slides by clicking on the notes tab than it is to call up somebody else in the office or in the histology lab and find the location of those things. And we no longer have arguments with histology about whether or not slides were delivered and who they were delivered to. I mean, the computer knows exactly where uh, things were. Overall, uh, we got two FTEs worth of savings out of our department just by being able to know slide locations. And the way it broke down was in the histology lab, uh, uh, we had less time spent looking for misdelivered slides. All of the work list orders were closed out automatically. Uh, the person who is preparing and gathering slides for conference purposes uh, had much expedited workflow. And the people doing lab, uh, send outs of slides to outside uh, places had much more efficient workflow also. Um, we also have functionality for tracking specimens. You remember we put barcodes on specimens at the time that they were grossed in. And we already talked about how things get accessioned, examined at the gross bench, and put, tissue gets put in cassettes, which goes on to make uh, slides. 
but the residual tissue has to be stored and then ultimately it has to be discarded. And the rule for discard is you have to hold things until two weeks after the report is signed out, which is very problematic for the person who's doing the discards because the person doing the discards generally has no idea when a case was signed out unless they make a handwritten list of all the specimens and then they go look them up one by one in the computer system and then figure out which ones are signed out and which are appropriate to discard. So we built uh, uh, software that uses these handheld pocket PCs that have wireless communication. They have a built-in barcode scanner and they can run their own little uh, autonomous software on them. Um, and we tried to make this whole process more accurate and efficient and document everything. Um, and the way it works is uh, the user walks up, scans the barcode on a specimen, and the display on the computer changes. If it's been less than two weeks since the, since the case was signed out, uh, you get the red stoplight and the red background and the person knows not to discard the specimen. If it's been more than two weeks, then they get the green stoplight and the green background and it's okay to discard the specimen. And there are occasional exceptions that we can accommodate and those exceptions trigger the uh, yellow caution light and the particular message that was put into PowerPath on, that has to do with uh, whether or not to discard a specimen gets displayed right on the handheld device so that the person can uh, make a decision right then whether or not to discard things. And one can also update specimen locations, and I'm not going to show you that right now, except that, again, we have specimen location notes that show that these different specimens, some of them are in storage and some of them were discarded. And again, every user is one click away. We also, within Omnitrax, uh, keep track of all of the uh, scanned events, uh, like when you go on FedEx and you want to see what happened to your package. Well, this particular test specimen went from the purple bin to the blue bin to the red bin to the yellow bin, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really valuable information for troubleshooting purposes if there was a problem of some sort. So we picked up some efficiencies for managing discards, but importantly, we made it a more accurate and simple uh, discard process. We also used the specimen barcodes to drive gross photography, and we're building some other things having to do with cytology specimen management. Um, we also use the shipment functionality to track slide shipments between institutions. We track uh, things as they're shipped to off-site archives. We drive gross photography. We drive uh, microscopy at the uh, pathologist's uh, <coughs> microscope. We do document scanning that's driven by barcodes. Uh, we'll soon uh, deliver HPV testing workflow improvements driven by barcodes. Um, and, and we're thinking about doing some of these other things. So if you add it all up and look at the sort of benefits that we got in the department from barcoding, just looking at direct personnel, uh, the slide delivery, the slide tracking system saved us two FTEs. I've shown you how we saved three quarters in the gross room, uh, specimen discards, document scanning, and fluorescence microscopy uh, also uh, provided incremental benefits. So this. Um, was valuable to us to the tune of about three FTEs worth of work that's being saved. And if you figure that an FTE, if you picked a round number like $50,000 annual salary for somebody working uh, in these positions, that's about $150,000 a year of operational costs that are saved in the department. But there are also indirect benefits that, that ripple out from that, such that, uh, for example, if you scan uh, paperwork from outside consult cases into the computer and make it more available to people, we get a half FTE benefit of pathologist time uh, throughout the department. Uh, we have other benefits from scanning the rec forms and knowing slide locations, indirect benefits, and we don't lose things um, uh, in the way we were in danger of losing things before. And finally, we do achieve huge error reduction benefits. The, the one that, I measure, that we've measured and I'm most proud of is the block labeling error rate, which dropped essentially to zero with, with this sort of software. So where do things head in the future? Most laboratory information systems were architected about 10 years ago or more. And at that time, the only thing people thought about were specimens, blocks, and slides. That was the universe for anatomic pathology. Everything else was the clinical lab. But these days, the, the lines between the clinical lab and anatomic pathology are blurred. We have 
non-traditional samples that get analyzed in anatomic pathology. Some serum, some serologic tests. Uh, we make DNA and RNA extracts. In some uh, laboratories, we culture cells. We do microdissections, tissue microarrays. All these sorts of things can't be handled in the traditional laboratory information system. But the way we've designed our our material tracking system, our barcode-driven system, all of these things can be can be handled, and we can extend the core functionality of what we've got to, to accommodate them. Thinking from an enterprise perspective, and everything I've shown you so far has been limited to what happens within the pathology department, but things really start from the patient. The specimens come out of patients, and they have to be tracked before they get to the pathology department. And we need to be able to do that, maybe with electronic orders, maybe using RFID chips or, or some other sort of technology. Um, there's a call to have sample location visible at the enterprise level. So a person, uh, a, a doctor that does a biopsy on someone wants to know for sure that it made it to the lab. If, if we now accession and barcode things, if we can find a way of making that information known to the enterprise, then the doctor can be notified and be assured that uh, the specimen that he uh, took has made it to the lab. Um, and we also, particularly in an academic medical center like this, we need to support translational research. And the uh, biorepository um, uh, functionality is important. That's something we're going to be building. And having that tied to the diagnostic reports in a, an appropriately de-identified manner so that uh, research can be facilitated is, is an important goal for an academic institution like this. So in conclusion, I would say that barcoding automation is much more than just labeling. It's much more than just tracking. You may get some benefits using those, but where you really get benefits is if you move into the driving level of functionality and that you use the barcodes to change the workflow, to apply disruptive technology. It lets us um, do an increased workload with the same number of people, or in some uh, instances, people can do much more fulfilling, life-affirming jobs than the sort of menial labeling tasks that they used to be doing. Uh, patient safety is improved, and this is definitely justifiable technology from a fiscal point of view. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that were uh, part of this process, my development team uh, is on the top here. Uh, they've all put countless hours into this process. Uh, various other people that we've worked with along the way, uh, Aaron Grimm, who's uh, one of the residents, has been working with users a lot and pulling data together. Dan Luff took a lot of the pictures. Uh, Steve Rath is a pathology assistant, and uh, Pam Seltz works in the gross room. Um, and we've also had technical support from companies like General Data and Thermo Shandon um, and AccuPlace. So thank you very much, very much for uh, this opportunity to tell you this story, and I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Dan. So, Rob, that's, that's really nice work you've done. I can, you know, based on our personal experience and the team path, this is, you know, you don't necessarily appreciate all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes, so it's really nice to see it. It seems to me the weak link in this whole process is, though, getting from the patient in the OR, wherever procedures have been done, to pathology. So are you working currently at trying to like get basically put barcode scanners in the ORs and get the stuff labeled there? Or what's the sort of the status with that? Yeah. So um, while this is still, still all on conceptual stage, um, in fact, there really aren't many things that are available commercially at this point. So if you're doing a a build versus buy sort of decision, whether you're gonna build something yourself or buy it, you really don't have much of a buy option. So we've been thinking about what the functional requirements of this would be, you know, exactly what would have to happen, how would it interface with the software that the people in the operating room use. Presumably they would use software that would generate a barcoded label that would get stuck on, and then in the background there would have to be an electronic order that gets transmitted from the computer in the operating room to our computer to notify us that a specimen will be arriving which has this particular identify, identifying barcode on it. Uh, but that will be a project to be worked on over the next uh, months to a year or two.
Mike. That's, that's really great talk. Um, the, the, uh, how do you make sure that the first step, the initial data entry, because that's one of our big problems, the initial data entry uh, does not have a higher error rate. What are you doing there? Because once that's, once that's, it seems like from your system, once that's good, you're in great shape. Yeah. Yep. So um, that's an excellent point. That very first step is critical. And um, the way we've dealt with that, they're, they're, that's outside of software at that point. That's in the human stage because the information is not even entered into the computer yet. So ultimately, when we want to get orders and specimen tracking coming into the computer before the specimen ever arrives. But until that happens, we have a, a single piece workflow um, that is required at the accessioning step. So people only have one thing out at a time and that they uh, double check the paperwork with the information that's in the computer. There are, that's a long-standing problem in anatomic pathology and the laboratory information systems have a lot of error check opportunities as things are accessioned into the case uh, so that uh, to, to eliminate those sort of errors or um, uh, minimize them as much as possible. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I have uh, two quick questions. The first is, are you doing this for intraoperative frozen sections? Because at the time, speed can be an issue. And then also, on evenings or weekends, there might not be a technologist there to enter all the stuff. Yeah. OK, so those are excellent things. Because frozen sections, because of the time critical nature of them in the operating room, um, often are done before the uh, case is ever accessioned into the laboratory information system. There is no accession number yet at that point. That is a problem that we're looking at right now because that means that for those specimens we're relying on humans labeling things and keeping track of them. And fortunately the volume is such that um, we usually have just a small number of specimens that are active at any one point and we can, we can keep track of things as we go. But that's a definite um, issue that needs to be addressed better and we've, we have some ideas about it, how to do that perhaps with pre-labeled uh, cassettes that have unique identifiers that can be then associated with with cases later on as a way of, uh, of dealing with that. For the after hours um, issue, there are two approaches that can be done. One is again a manual process which uh, has some opportunities for error in it. The other is uh, we do uh, allow residents uh, to do limited accessioning after hours and have instructions on how to do that so they can get an accession number. And once they have an accession number and once they have the specimen in, they can generate all the blocks that they need that are all correctly barcoded and labeled. Yes, Mark. Yeah, interesting uh, story. Do you plan to commercialize this and recoup your expenses for developing this? Uh, yeah, uh, we are working on that, and we've been uh, we've had some limited success to this point. Um, we have uh, our first uh, customer, which is directly licensed from the university to the uh, pathology lab, is in Eugene, Oregon, and uh, since then we have uh, also licensed through an intermediary company to a pathology group in uh, Fresno, California. And uh, UCLA Pathology is also, um, has this system now partially uh, installed. All the slide tracking stuff is in and working and they're enjoying that and they're in the process of implementing the, uh, the gross room and histology pieces. And we also have a couple other um, you know, irons in the fire, so to speak. Uh, so yes, that's definitely uh, on our minds because at this point, to be honest, this is as good as anything that's available commercially. There's only one other commercial offering that has the capabilities is what we've built here. There are a number of others that are starting to come out with that, but at this point, uh, this is the best stuff in the world that we know of. Yes? Uh, the process that you showed <clears throat> when there was uh, what seemed to be a fairly manual process of a technologist determining which specimens were available to be thrown out or discarded, um, so it's sort of doing an inventory every single time of that. Does the software have the capability of sort of auto-generating that inventory? So rather than somebody having to you know, scan the specimen, it'll already tell you which specimens to look for and just... Yeah. So that's an interesting idea. And, and the notion was you might have a large bin, for example, that might have a barcode on it. And you would put these specimens in this bin and then you would just scan the bin and the computer could check automatically and see if everything was there. Well, how does a computer know when something's in the bin? 
somebody has to scan the barcode and scan it into the bin so that the computer knows about it. So you're already doing that scanning event. And then let's say you have a bin that has 100 specimens in it. And you scan the bin, and the computer comes back and says, well, you can toss out 97, but three of them still need to be saved. Well, then how do you find those three? It's a, it's a pretty manual process. So it seemed to us that it was as efficient and less error prone overall just to have things sitting on the shelf and scan them one by one and deal with it right at the time, right then. I think uh, Dr. Schmidt can uh, probably stay and answer a few more questions afterwards. But let's, uh, let's thank him again for a great talk. Thank you.